outside speaker or not, because uh, he is a full professor at Sinclair Community College, uh, but he uh, also teaches here as an adjunct. He's been teaching here since uh, 2007, unless that's that long. So my colleague here is Lois Benazouz. He is a graduate of Wright State University. Um, just some fun facts about Moez. Um, he likes Chelsea Football Club. He follows soccer a lot. Um, he has a red Mini Cooper, which is currently <coughs> coming out of the shop. Uh, those are the cars that use the Italian job, in case you prefer. Okay. Um, he speaks four languages. What four languages do you speak? I know French is one of them. French, <coughs> Italian, Arabic, and English. Very good. And he has two poodles, and his lovely wife is here to watch him. It's actually his ride to pick up his car after uh, Linda, and she owns the Oasis Salon and Spa, which makes me familiar with this downtown. So thank you, uh, Moez, for agreeing to do this. He's going to talk about the mathematical model of the skin pattern. He's going to mention a famous mathematician. Yes, mystery. Who, Mystery mathematician who uh, gives me his point. That's okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, the way we're going to start this talk is by looking at these pictures of beautiful animals, and in this case, leopards. Although, do you spot the odd picture there? This one doesn't have spots. That's a jaguar. Right? So you've got leopards and uh, you've got a jaguar there. And uh, a mathematician in the 1950s was very curious about complexity in nature. And what he wanted to know is, how does complexity in nature come about? So for instance, if you're looking at growth in nature, if you look at an embryo, it's going to start from something that's perfectly symmetric mathematically, so it could be a spherical shape, like a cell, a fertilized egg. And then something happens that turns this egg into an embryo that actually develops limbs, and you get organs, something that he called self-organization. So how do these cells, from perfect symmetry, break that symmetry and start to differentiate themselves into all these different uh, paths. That think, think of it as like students choosing majors. Right? You, go, <coughs> you go to school, you go to high school, and then you kind of feel your way through school, and then you, have to, you haven't decided yet what is quite the career for you yet. So then you get to college, you start taking classes, maybe you have an idea what's your major is going to be, and then at some point you decide, well, this is really what I want to do, and then you pick that path and you try to follow that career path. The same thing seems to happen with cells. They start from all of them the same, so you start from a zygote, which will be a fertilized egg, and then it goes into mitosis and it creates many other uh, cells, and then at some point something happens that makes these cells kind of choose a major, right? So they differentiate themselves. So certain cells decide that they're going to be the cells uh, responsible for the, they're going to be the skeletal cells, so for the mus muscles. You're going to have some cells that decide to become nerve neurons or nerve cells. Right? So how do they differentiate themselves? How do they decide? How does the symmetry break? This is what this mathematician uh, was curious about. And it's the same thing in nature. So if you're looking at some animals in nature, if you look at even skin patterns, why certain animals have spots? Don't. And some animals don't even have spots. Jaguar is not exactly uh, a leopard, so it doesn't have the same kind of pattern in it. And some animals don't even have spots. Humans don't have spots or you know, stripes. So, why? This is what this mathematician was very curious about. And this mathematician, you know who this guy is? What's the name? Alan. Alan. That's, no, that's actually uh, Benedict Cumberbatch. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping to let you fall for that. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, it's a, uh, well, the movie is obviously about Alan Turing, and that's the mystery mathematician. And this movie came out last year, uh, Imitation, 
this is the invitation game, and it's about the life of Turin. Now, what's more known about Turing? Turing lived in, in England in the 50s, and he was really one of the code breakers at Bletchley Park in 1945 and during the war. He was pretty much a hero, national hero. And then, uh, unfortunately, something happened in that 10 years. He died in 1954, June 7, 1954. <coughs> and the, allegedly, he killed himself by eating an apple that he laced with cyanide. And the, there's so much mystery and controversy around his death that so many stories came out. Nobody knows how he died. Some people don't understand it. Don't, don't believe that he actually killed himself and somebody actually killed him. He was unfortunately the victim of a persecution by his own government, even after being a hero for so many years because of his homosexuality. And in England back then, they had laws that actually uh, punished people who were homosexual and he ended up paying the price for that. And they had to make it go through some hormone therapy that was forced by court and that really um, basically sent him over the edge. But the, the genius side of this guy, who's really uh, somebody that was lost too early for mathematicians, is that he did so many things in his short life. He died at the age of 41. He did so many things during his short life in many different areas. He did work in, as a crypt analyst, coach breaker. He also laid the foundation for what we have now, uh, what we call now the digital, digital computer. He actually started the whole idea of thinking about artificial intelligence. Uh, he came up with the uh, Turing machine and how you can actually get uh, built or designed philosophically how a machine can respond to instructions. He pretty much laid the foundation for the computer. He contributed to fields of philosophy and so many other areas. But the area that I'm going to talk about today is the area that not many people know about. He actually wrote one paper in 1952, and the paper is called The Chemical Basis of Morphogenesis. And this is what we're talking about today. And this is where he just wanted to understand this symmetry break in nature. How does it happen? What causes it? So he decided he's going to actually build a model for the embryo, mathematical model. So he had to look at what are, what happens. So what are some of the assumptions he has to, to make about this model? And he realized, well, he has to make some mathematical assumptions. He has to also look at the chemistry of what's happening. And he has to <coughs> also look at the biology. But there are some mechanical forces that take place between the cells. There's also the chemical reactions. There's the biology of the cells. There's the geometric structure of the cells. There's so many things going on. His model said, you know what, here's what I'm going to look at. If you take, let's say, ink and put it in water, you'll see the drop of ink go down into the water and then it starts to spread around. It's kind of like putting cologne on it. So it's concentrated in the bottle and then it spreads and then you spray yourself with cologne and then it, it spreads. That's, that process is called diffusion. Right? So that ink diffuses in water and then after a while it reaches a state of equilibrium where you don't notice that you have a drop of ink in water you actually see the whole water is now turning blue so that's called diffusion and diffusion when it starts eventually leads to a certain equilibrium position then on the other hand he looked at chemical reactions chemical reactions you take two reagents or reactants and put them in, and they react and they produce a new uh, chemical substance, <coughs> and then at some point the reaction will reach a stable, or what we call an equilibrium state, right? So stable position. So he said, okay, what if I consider both of these at the same time, which is at the time something that nobody else considered? So he said, what if what's actually happening at the cell level is I have these two chemicals that react, but at the same time they're diffusing. So they're not just reacting to, pr to produce uh, another chemical or produce one or the other. They're actually moving at the same time. So how's that going to affect the system? And he did this with some chemicals, and he found some 
interesting patterns. He found that if he mixes these two chemicals, he will just get a uniform color. But if he actually adds diffusion to the whole thing, then he doesn't get actually a uniform color. He gets these interesting patterns. So there was something that was weird happening there. And he couldn't get these patterns to go away. And so he reached an actual state of equi equilibrium, but it's an unstable equilibrium. That's what he was able to come up with. And that's what gave him the idea of setting up the model. So what is the idea about the modeling? I don't want to worry too much about a lot of the information that he took under assumption, but the most important thing to keep in mind is that he said, okay, I'm going to start with this, consider these two substances. So one is going to, we're going to call activator, so let's label it A. One is called the inhibitor. And the way it works, you're going to have this activator, call them morphogens, morph means, uh, morph means form, and morphogens means form or uh, or would be form and uh, gen means beget. So this is basically, these are two substances that produce form. Okay, so think of them as form producers. That's what he, Nick, he call, used that phrase to describe them and then it became a standard thing. And that's where the word morphogenesis comes from, through the whole process. So he said, okay, these are the morphogenesis. And these are, don't have to be genes, but these are some examples. These are basically chemical substances that seem to show up during, in the cell. And these are the two substances that will interact. And what he said, okay, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to come back to this in a second. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to consider two functions, A of x comma t. Okay, now that looks confusing. Here is basically what that says. That says A is the amount of this activator <coughs> that you start with. The X, he just worked in one dimension. So he assumes we have this like ring of cells. Make it simple. So you're going to, it's like working on a number line. So X is just the spatial dimension and there's <coughs> one dimension. T is time. So I of XT is actually the amount of inhibitor at a certain position on that line at a certain time t. Okay. And then he said, okay, let's see if we can figure out how they're going to interact. And he came up with this system of partial differential equations. Partial differential equations, and this is why I said I'm going to go back here, depending on whether you took calculus or not, or whether you've seen differential equations or not, uh, you may not be familiar with this. So this is like a quick primer differential equations. So I don't want you to get scared too much of this notation. There are only two slide, slides where you have a lot of math notation. This one, the next one, and after that it's gone. So, but what I want you to get out of this is that if you have a function, basically the gradient of that function, or rate of change, with respect to the dependent variable, with respect to the independent variable, which in this case x, we use the notation dy dx for that. So if I have a function, that does something like this, and that function is f, then at that point, if I measure the slope right there, the slope is described by that dy dx. And the slope has a significance, is that it, it tells you how fast, at that point, how fast the actual function is changing with respect to x. Now, if your variable is not x, it's time, then it'll be the rate of change with respect to function. So that's really the concept of the derivative of the function. That's what it's, its job is basically to find velocity, how fast something is changing with respect to another variable. But what if you have two variables? So like this case, you have a function that has x and t, which is what we're using in the next slide. Then when you take the derivative, you have to be specific. Are you doing the rate of change with respect to the x or to the t? So you don't use that notation over there. You would have to use this term you need here. So you do du dt, and we call that the partial derivative instead of the derivative. So partial derivative of u with respect to t. Okay, so those are just symbols for partial derivative. Everybody okay so far with the notation? Okay. So that's really the extent. <coughs> like, 
crazy method <coughs> what you see. Again, some of this stuff here, I don't want you to worry about solving this. I want you to really be more interested in the qualitative look at how he set this up. So this means how fast A is changing with respect to up. This tells you how much of A is being produced, the activity. This here is telling you how, how fast is I changing with respect to time. And this here is telling you how much of I is being produced. And the way the I and the A are working is the activator produces both. So the activator, the chemical that's the activator, is, its job is to produce some of A and then also produces I. And I tries to reduce the amount of A. That's the job of I. It's an inhibitor. So it tries to reduce the amount of it. So you see how that works? One is trying to produce both, and the other one is trying to produce what it tries to just destroy what A is, right? The quantity of A that you have. And these are two basically conflicting things that are happening at the same time. And to make it even more interesting, they're moving. They're diffusing. So this right here is keeping track of that motion. So this is the second derivative of A with respect to X. So it's telling you how fast is the rate of change of A with respect to X changing. <laughs> so you do a derivative of the rate of change of rate of change. And this right here has this D in front of it, which is a constant or a coefficient, that he had to play around with. Okay, so he had to decide what numbers to plug in there. We had to experiment to get the right balance. So the, the most important thing to take away from this scary look at the stuff here is that he played around with this formula here, these formulas. He played around with the parameter d, and he found out for the right numbers, he can hit that unstable equilibrium where he gets these patterns. <coughs> the idea and the interesting thing that he found out is that the pattern that shows up, it's like oscillations in a, or vibrations in a guitar string. So if you have, let's say, a short string and you try to get a vibration of that, you're probably not going to get many modes to show up. But the longer the string, the more modes you get to show up. You get oscillations to show up. And that number of modes is actually going to decide how many spots or how many patterns you're going to get. So this is what you look at. All right. So we just described that. So here's the 2D model that kind of shows you a little bit of what he ended up with. So this is the pattern. He did the same thing, but instead of doing this over a line, he went in the x direction and y direction. So it's two dimensional. And then he got this pattern to show up. So again, these are like oscillations in 3D. So what do you notice there? It's like a landscape of activator. These peaks here are these points where the activator is highest. And the valleys in between are the points where the activators are lowest. Now, this was very interesting to him. So, so he said, okay, so this is like the pre pattern. This is like the code that the actual uh, cells receive. So these morphogens tell the cells, you know what? Here's the pre pattern. Now go ahead and make sure you differentiate to match this. So this creates the pattern for the actual cell to differentiate whatever it's doing. Now, he didn't realize this when he wrote the paper. He wasn't paying attention to skin pigments altogether. But when he saw the pictures of his calculations, that's when it occurred to him that this matches the patterns of skins of certain animals. Like in, the, in his case, he looked at the cows in England and he looked at the patterns you know, black and white, and he saw that the patterns that he got with his calculations are very similar to that. And that's when it occurred to him that, oh, this is a perfect application. It's just looking at the skin pigments of the cow. So here comes now more interesting things. So, the Turin patterns, let's learn a few things about them. And let's find out that they really, they seem to corroborate what we see in nature. This right here is a perfect example of what he saw. So if these activators actually 
activate skin cells that deal with pigments, then this is the pattern you would get. These black dots there are like those peaks in that landscape I showed you earlier. But then the question becomes, okay, so how can the cheetah has spots? And then other animals have maybe different, maybe larger sized spots, or some of them don't even have spots. So he found out that there's a threshold. If you keep making the domain bigger, it does affect the type of patterns you're going to get. And it does affect how close together they might be. So here is what he found out. There are three major factors. Thresholds, saturation, and size of the domain. We're going to explain each one of them, and we're going to show you some nice pictures of animals to see how this works. So thresholds. So threshold, think of it as like a, the activator has a certain level that it has to hit before turning on the cell that it's trying to activate. So what does that mean? So for instance, you get a certain concentration of the activator in the cell. Once you hit that level that's required, then that activator tells the cell, go ahead and turn that color black. But what does that mean? That means a certain height in these peaks that you have to reach before that happens. So depending on how high that is, you could, if it happens really low, then you get a much larger area that gets turned black or changes color if we're talking about the skin thickness. And if that threshold is pretty high, then you're going to get a very tiny region that's going to be turned on and it's going to cover only a certain part of the skin. So that's the difference that you notice. Now here's a good example of that nature. These are two different uh, species of giraffes. The Rothschild giraffe has a th high threshold. So this is one of those where you're getting much smaller markings there. But this one is a low threshold, so you're getting much larger markings there in between. So it's again, the threshold is what's actually de decided on that. What about zebras? Yes, we're going to get to that. <laughs> yes. All right, so here we are. <laughs> okay, so the question is, well, wait a minute. That doesn't make any sense. Okay, well, how about zebras, right? So, so well, this, that's why we have three factors. So saturation is the next thing that we have to look at. And saturation, think of it as like the max, there's a maximum level of activator that you can reach. And if that maximum level is reached, the concentration is so high, so there's saturation. And what happens is you have so much of the activator and the diffusion is not happening fast enough. So the, the inhibitor that's trying to destroy the activator is not doing that fast enough. So what that ends up doing, ends up everything gets turned off. Now, if not every single part that gets turned on, then you get these merge, merge the things, these spots get merged into much longer stripes because you get much larger area that's being turned on to, to use the color black in this case. Right? Does that address your question? So, so, the, so you have to look at the thresholds, but also what is the maximum concentration of the activator that you could reach? If you reach that, then the diffusion is not happening fast enough to, to create those patterns, those modes around the, the peaks of the other colors. So you get these peaks to fuse together into stripes instead. Okay, but what's the third important factor? And this is really the most important factor he found to, to uh, have the most effect on the patterns that he got is that the size of the domain. And again, I'm going back to one dimension here to make it easier. So if you're going to one line and you make it really short, so again, it's kind of like using a musical instrument here. If you take a, a, a guitar string and you pluck that and you try to see how many modes you create, depending on the length of the string and how tight it is, that obviously is going to affect how many modes you end up with. 
So here, this is just, don't worry too much about the units, it's more just to show you that the longer, the more oscillations you get. So, if it's really small domain you're working with, so this is your x-axis, if you wish, then that pattern is not going to have much diffusion space, which means you're not going to have many peaks. You're lucky if you get one more. Here, you get to see a little bit more oscillation. Here you get to see a lot more, and what happens when you reach, reach that threshold, that's where they kind of fuse together, the peaks fuse together, and you get that strike. Like that. What happens if you go even farther? You don't see any patterns. That's why large animals don't have, typically don't have uh, any stripes or spots, like an elephant doesn't have any. Also, if you have a very small domain, like mice, most of them don't have any they usually have a uniform color. Okay. All right, so, so the size of the domain we said affects the type of the pattern. We said, but wait a minute, there's something here crazy. Look at the cheetah. You've got the spots all over, right? And look at the tail. It goes from spots. What happens to the, at the end? It goes back to stripes. Now what's happening there is because, think of the tail of the, the cheetah as like a cylinder, cylindrical shape, but it gets narrower as you go toward the end. So the domain reduces. And as the domain reduces, we call it a tapered domain. So as the domain reduces in size, then that affects the kind of, uh, <coughs> kind of spots you get. So actually what happens is that activator doesn't have much room, so it goes, winds around, and connects, reconnects with itself. So you get the activator to turn on all these spots all around, and they merge together into structures. Now, one, based on uh, Turing's theory, that's why it's easy to, for you to find in nature an animal that's spot, that, that has spots with a striped tail, but you're not going to see a striped animal spots in this thing. Okay, so this is based on Turing's model and Turing's patterns. That shouldn't happen. Okay? Now, we'll revisit that thought. <laughs> so let me see, I can show you right here. There's a YouTube video. And this is actually a nice video that's put by students at Oxford and Princeton, I think. And they basically, and if you're really interested as a student, to if you're curious and you want to learn about this and learn about the mathematics behind it, I really recommend you check this out because it's actually going to give you, um, let's see here, I'm going to pause this. It's going to give you at least an idea of how to approach the mathematics behind it. I'm not going to show you the whole thing here. I just want to show you a certain part where the animation for the pattern formation. So, let me see here. So, watch. Okay, let me show you here what they do. Oops, how do I get it to show up there? Oh, let's see. It's asking me if I should allow it. Yeah. I said yes. Showing up on my computer, not showing up on my computer. Okay, we fix this. I want to show you this because it's what they basically did. Very good. Thank you. Okay, so here's what, what's going on here. So this is a, an animation. So this is based on calculations. And they basically did an animation to show you how Turing patterns show up. And the difference here, they did the one-dimensional and the two-dimensional uh, space. And they did the small domain versus the large domain. So what they want you to see here, here up top, that's a really small domain. So that's like a short distance on the x-axis. And here, they made it a lot longer. And that's where you're going to see the difference between how many oscillations you're going to see. But at the same time, they did that for the two-dimensional case. So a small two-dimensional domain versus the, this much larger two-dimensional. And watch the patterns that will show up. So this is a cool thing about this. So this is a nice. So they're doing, what they're doing is actually increasing the concentration here. 
and they're showing you what happens. Here we go. See how the, those patterns have started to form at the spots? What's actually taking place right there is exactly what we described earlier, which is the activator and the the activator and the uh, inhibitor are at work, and they're reactive and they're diffusing at the same time. And what happens at some point, they reach this end-state or equilibrium state where it's those dots, where you have these modes of the act inhibitor around these like peaks of the activator, and that's what creates those spots. Now, notice, look at the left one, left side of that. Is it actually forming those spots on the left side? It's not forming spots here, but it is forming spots here. Why? Domain is bigger. Okay, so the domain, he found out the domain being larger has really a major impact on how you reach that equilibrium. If you, by the way, if you're interested in, in my slides or, or you want me to email you any of the stuff I have in my PowerPoint, so let me know, I'll be glad to do that. There's some nice links. All right, so let's go back. Again. Okay, so so is that making sense to everybody? So the size of the domain is very important. Okay, when does it stop? Well, he found out that for mammals, remember this this whole thing that we're talking about is happening between two stages. One one stage for the zygote or the the fertilized egg at, that's called the blastula, and one stage that's called the gastrula. So to go from the one stage to the next, it's called the gastrulation phase. This whole thing is happening during that phase. So this is this whole process of, if you're talking about the skin pattern formation, is going to be over by the, by the time the embryonic stage is over. So this doesn't continue for the, uh, throughout the adult life of the, uh, the animal or even for humans. But he found out that for mammals that's the case. And people who did follow on afterwards they found out that actually there are certain species where this doesn't stop. So this pattern formation, formation can keep going and happening as they're getting bigger and bigger in size. So one example is the angelfish. As it starts, these stripes are really narrow and tight together. And as it gets bigger, it starts widening. The stripes get much more pronounced. And that's one of the odd ones in nature where that seems to happen. But again, with mammals in general, all of the, the patterns are basically done at the embryonic stage. So once you get past the embryonic stage, that animal already knows what, whether it's going to have spots or not. Right? So if you can examine it at that point, you know exactly what it's going to look like as, as an adult animal. All right, so the big question is, was Turing right? Which is not the most important question, but it is an interesting question. Because if you're curious and you're like, okay, this is a cool, I mean, that seems to cool. I showed you all the animals where it seems to fit. What do you notice about this animal? Solid stripes. Yeah, so you have solid body color, and then you have striped tail. This is basically a direct violation of the predictions of uh, Turing's theory. This is actually called the ring tail lemur. It's a, it's a primate that lives in the island of Madagascar off the coast of South Africa, south, southern part of Africa. So, so this basically, you know, flies in the face of everything Turing was talking about. But does that mean that, you know, Turing's model was a failure? Well, actually, what Turing's model did, and Mathematically, any mathematician will tell you, every mathematical model is really, if you think it right or wrong, you can say that every mathematical model is wrong. Because mathematical models have to simplify nature, reality. So think it, you have to make some assumptions when you build a model. So you have to reduce the number of variables you work with. You can't consider everything. Otherwise, the model becomes too complicated and too difficult to manage or solve or, or actually uh, simulate solution for it. But even if the model is not accurate at all times, those kind of models can still be very revealing 
and they can lead to more experimentation. They can bring new questions that lead other, inspire new people to do more research and learn more. Here's the interesting thing about Turing's paper. I have a copy of that if you'd like to see it, by the way. Turing's paper, it's 27 pages long, it's not that bad really. And, but one thing interesting about his, his paper is that it only had six references. Because during the time he was doing this, nobody else paid attention to this. Nobody, even in the field of biology. Biology at, in that era, in that time, in the 50s, was all about the classification. So it was all about going around and just organizing, classifying species, classifying things. It was more about bookkeeping. It wasn't really worried about developmental biology, which is what he was actually looking at. But once he actually had that paper out, and people learned a little bit about it, this, action, this paper was, became one of the most cited papers in biology. And, and it, which is interesting, because it was written by a mathematician. And for the next 30, 40 years, and over the past 60 years or so, this, this field of developmental biology completely took off. And it's all thanks to his foray in, in this area. And it's, you know, a lot of people thought, you know, he had really no place or no right to even go in there because he's a mathematician. He shouldn't be wrestling and trying to answer biological questions. But nowadays, Wait, there's so many models. He has every right to be there. <laughs> exactly. So, nowadays, you know, mathematicians, uh, nowadays, biologists now actually are doing a lot, they went completely the other way. They're doing a lot more data collection and so many simulations and things like that, and less classification stuff. They're beyond this thing. So, so yes, his model, you know, you can, you can find flaws in it. It's a theory, you know, it doesn't have to fit everything, but it does have its own, uh, rewards and it led to interesting things. Here's the other interesting thing that happened since, uh, since his paper. These people, these things that he actually came up with, it was more with this. It's all theoretical, he made up all this stuff, right? They actually found that they exist. <laughs> okay. So with research, research nowadays, they found that these morphogens actually exist. And now they're taught in biology. Right? But the way he thought the pre catalan happened and how it leads to cell differentiation, that was much more simplistic. They're, they're finding out now that it's a lot more complicated than that. But, but then some of the stuff he came up with really uh, took off. Yeah. So here's the other interesting thing. The mathematics he did, these reaction diffusion equations they call them, have so many other applications in so many other areas. So you, can, you don't have to just model what happens at the embryonic stage. You can use those same similar types of equations to model all these examples. So tumor growth, limb regeneration, hydra is a certain plant that actually can regenerate its own limbs, like tentacles. So that's a very interesting thing to research. And spread of wildfire, this is a current event, you know, so you can model those by using reaction diffusion equations. The civil unrest terrorism, that's also, you know, that's something current events. All these can be modeled using very similar equations and they can give you very good results. But every model is a simplification of reality and you always have to collect new data and check your, check your observations, check your actual hypotheses, Check your uh, results based uh, with the actual data, the new data that you get, and it's a continuous improvement process where you try to make the model better and better. And you hope that you can get a much better model that can help you predict future. So that's my talk, and we just uh, would like to everybody give a round of applause for Alan Turing because he really <laughs> did so much and he didn't get appreciated as much. Saying they have spots right on their body, or 
Yeah, like on their actual skin, but on their fur, there's no spots. Like there'll be a solid fur color, but then they'll have spots. Like if you shave on them, you can tell they have spots. Oh, so that's like, what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, so this right here, with, this is more about the actual spots that are, that are underneath the fur. Okay. So his, his pattern name, the model, is more about the spots. So he would say, you know, looking at the size of the dog, and he can try to tell you uh, why it makes sense that it would have spots or not. But the fur, that's, that's something else. There must be some other morphogens that affect that. See, the model he looked at was just to how it affects the skin pattern. But if you, if you have to look at other aspects, like how certain dogs are going to have you know, longer legs than others, and other, then there's so many other things that would, you would have to almost have like separate models for those. Yeah. That's a very good question. Any other questions? Yes? I'm not sure if you're in town with this at all or not, but uh, post developmentally, uh, did you, or I guess this kind of like might explain like the lemur or the end of the tail on the jaguar or cheetah, uh, did you find anything on how that pre developmental, uh, I guess? One of the things that biologists looked at when they looked at that case, they said what's actually happening is kind of like my like response to the other question. They said maybe his assumption that the same patterning should happen over the body and the tail is wrong. So the tail is treated as a separate domain and the actual body is treated as a separate domain. So that so if you consider that, then you then it would make sense that they wouldn't necessarily match. So the, so the tail is a completely separate model then from the actual body. That's yeah. one thing that they would yeah. The activators in the uh, crust, uh, there's end, you know, the under, underlying enzymes uh, can affect those and the difference in body temperature. Yes. Can affect those. So maybe that's why the lemur uh, on its body uh, is a high body temperature, therefore mutation is expressed. That's a very, that's a very good uh, question. Actually, when they actually started to, to find, see, here's the problem. They have a lot of problem coming up with good information because it's very difficult and very controversial to do research on embryos, even on certain animals. So it's very hard to go in there, even though now they know that these morphogens exist, it's very hard for them to actually get the actual concentrations and observe this happening during this stage. So they have to work with a lot of things based on assumptions and observations more than actually getting some accurate measurements and data. But what they are, what they try to do uh, they, they try to look at, are there any external things that could affect this morphogenesis? And they found like in butterflies, it happens for certain insects. Like if you take a butterfly, I wouldn't recommend doing this, but if you take a butterfly and you pin its uh, wing at the developmental stage, then the, when it, it will grow, it will continue to grow, but the patterns will be different. So you actually affect the patterning. And that, uh, so yes, so so that raises the question: the body temperature of the animal, or the type of animal, the cold blooded or not, those are the things that could affect that. But this field here, if you're a biologist, I mean, this is developmental the biology is a great field. It's a, it's new, it's emerging. There's so much research going on. Any other questions? Well, let's thank our speaker.